if you're like me, there's no way you can go back to school. You're trying to go the apprenticeship route and you're not getting anywhere. There's even still, there's FISDOs today that don't believe that it's a thing, but <laughs> definitely take a good hard look at this. Go to this two week course. And you get an actual, you know, FAA certificate in the mail. And work as a mechanic on those local aircraft for say, you know, 30 months or whatever it is for the experience. Okay, guys, welcome today. We're going to talk with Matt and his journey he's going through right now in the aircraft maintenance world, along with what his recent training was and what he can actually do with that. So let's jump right into it. So I know you've had guys on before. You have guys that went to school. You had guys that done an apprenticeship to get their A&P. Well, I think today we're going to talk about it another way called the light sport repairman that honestly a lot of people don't even know about. I don't know why it doesn't get more press than it does but it's definitely an option. And if nothing else, it starts that 30 month clock. You know, when you first mentioned it to me, I'm like, what is this again? Like I personally have not even heard of this. So discuss this because a lot of people haven't heard about this. Um, what exactly training, what's it called that you went to and how long was it and uh, what can you do with it? So this that. goes all the way back to, I think, believe it was 2004 when the light sport rule was uh, created. So, you know, you're creating this new class of aircraft, you know, that are certified to ASTM standards. Well, now what's the maintenance side going to look like? You know, you have to be able to maintain it to these ASTM standards. And, you know, a lot of the, the traditional A&Ps or whatnot aren't necessarily up to date on that. So as, you know, the rulemaking committee was coming together, developing the, the light sport class, you know, the maintenance class, the, you know, maintenance side of it was also coming together on the same. So between the a ASTM, other people in the industry, like the AA, I imagine the AOPA, uh, it was determined that you could go this repairman course. So as far as the FAA is concerned, you're not an A&P mechanic. You're not a mechanic, you're a repairman. But they develop two levels. So you have your light sport repairman, which is an inspection rating. So and it only it applies to one airplane. So if you buy, let's say, an SLSA, you can get it's mm -hmm. your inspection rating and you can do the conditions, the annual condition inspections on your airplane. Okay. That of course applies to one single plane, though. The and that is a that's a two day course, usually just over a weekend. Um, OK, wow. Yep. And that but again, that only applies to one airplane, uh, just like when you build a 51 percent build on an, an experimental amateur built and you get the repairman certificate, it only applies to that. So same concept. For the, in order to help maintain and support the light sport industry, the other category is light sport repairman maintenance. And that's a 120 hour course, uh, usually done over two weeks. Uh, there's a couple people doing it and we'll jump more into that and who's doing it and how. Um, mm -hmm. But that then gives you, it's a 120 hour course that gives you the ability and the privilege to work on, you know, maintain and inspect anything registered as an SLSA or an ELSA. You basically have IA privileges on light sports after a two week. So basically, yeah, two weeks, you can go to training, mm -hmm. you can come back and you can have the ability, the privilege, really, like you said, um, authorization to go in and do condition inspections or mm -hmm. annual inspection if it is a because there is certified life support aircraft Correct. and you can do certified annual on a light sport aircraft no, well okay so, so yeah that's only, that's what we need to define yeah. I guess. <laughs> so we, we have to differentiate here so there are certified aircraft that operate in a light sport category and you know we can pop up whatever all those criteria mm -hmm. are and what the applicable aircraft are right now yeah but because they have a standard airworthiness certificate, you still have to be an A&P to do the maintenance, you know, full maintenance. And I think pretty sure you still need an IA to do the okay. annual. Okay. Even though it classifies as a light sport, it still has a standard airworthiness certificate. Okay. Whether it was a factory built SLSA or a factory assembly, or not assembled, but a factory supplied kit. Okay. Like a Vans RV-12. Okay. You know, they have a, as far as I know, they have a third party that'll make, that'll build the RV-12 for you. And it's registered as an, it's considered a factory built airplane, an SLSA. Or mm -hmm. yep. they'll sell you the kit and you can build the airplane, you know, at least the 51%. And you can register it as an ELSA, you know, experimental LSA. Okay. Um, 
when it's an SLSA, it's very similar to a certified in that, you know, you have your parts manual, you have your shop manual, your, your maintenance manual, you have intervals and even specific parts that if you replace, you know, if you take, let's say an altimeter out, you have a very set list of things that can go back in the airplane. Like when the, the Cessna 162 came out. Yep. It's know, catch it up. That was, yeah, it was very strict, you know, what parts you could use and everything. It had to match your, your parts manual and what was originally intended. It's not like an experimental, like a lot of these, a lot of our experimentals, we just get what works and put it in. Um, mm -hmm. Or even like, say, in the case of the 162, you know, when, when it came out, it had to have an O200 en engine in it. Well, if you decide, decided you wanted to put a Rotax 912, well, that's not allowed per SLSA. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure about that particular airplane, but when some people do do that, um, what they'll actually do is move it from an SLSA to an ELSA because they're getting okay. out of the scope of what SLSA was. So a 162 Skycatcher, there's, mm -hmm. you know, they're out there and around. I haven't personally seen one other than at Oshkosh when they first were rolling them out yeah. several years ago. Um, if, if a guy had a 162 Skycatcher Cessna here locally and said, Hey, I'd like for you to do the, would that still be considered annual inspection? Correct, because it is registered and, you know, as an LSRM, and we go through this in the training, it is your responsibility to look up the end number on the FAA registry and make sure it is registered as a light sport, whether it's SLSA or an ELSA. And mm -hmm. there's three different categories of ELSA. I'm not going to get into that today, <laughs> but yeah, <that's> fine. <laughs> maybe maybe touch on it lightly. But, you know, the, the trainings for that. Yeah. Um, but there is. Yeah. So that's up to you as a repairman to make sure you're legally able to work on it. Cause unfortunately there has been people who think, you know, they go on barnstormers and something is advertised as a light sport. It's actually an EAB, but they've been signing off on it and they find themselves in trouble. So I'll touch on real quick, you know, one of the categories of ELSA, it was aircraft that were kind of, we'll say grandfathered in. So what we'll say is heavy ultralights. Okay. So, you know, this was part of why the light sport rule was created because you had guys building ultralights and ultralight trainers that may have been overweight, you know, maybe they're ultralight, <laughs> yeah. but to improve safety and, you know, to have, you know, good maintenance and better training, they were brought into the light sport rule as well. And so there was a period between 2004 and 2008 that you could register an ultralight, which of course didn't have an end number at that point. You could register it and it would be registered as an ELSA. So that that brought it into the light sport fold, but also brought it into, you know, the light sport maintenance requirements and, you know, an annual condition inspection and all that. Mm -hmm. but that also means, you know, I mean, an ultralight, you know, no license, no nothing required. Who knows what you got? <laughs> Hopefully it was built right. Hopefully it was maintained correctly. But this kind yeah. of brings it into more of the system. And, and we've seen over the years it did improve safety. Uh, just to clear a few things up here, so sure. you can you can work on a Cessna Skycatcher 162 because uh, it's registered can... as an SLSA. Yep. Okay. Okay. So, what aircraft would be considered in that category that people might be familiar with? Yeah, I mean, you know, the Vans RV12. I mean, that's kind of the the epitome yep. of light sport. Uh, you know, the sport cruiser. Uh, at one point, Piper had their name on it. Uh, now it's a another brand. Uh, a Vector Sports Star, uh, Thorpe had a it was the T two eleven, I believe. Jabru has their own. Uh, okay. As far as the bigger brands, you know, Pipistrel, Technum. I don't know mm -hmm. why I waited on Technum, but yeah, Pipistrel and Technum, those are big ones. Uh, the Remos, that's another okay. one. Uh, one of the newer ones out now is the Bristel. And there's probably more and more every year, I'm sure, because a lot of people's kind of getting into that market. It seems like, anyways, the last few years. So, well, yeah, I mean, you know, as the cost of everything goes up, you know, I mean, have gas at, you know, $7 a gallon, you know, do you really want to burn $8 or sorry, eight gallons an hour in a, in a 172 or do you want to burn four gallons an hour in a Rotax 912, you know? <laughs> I want to burn eight and a half gallons in a uh, clipper right here, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but yeah, I see where you're going. I mean, definitely, you know, if you don't need the space, if you just want to go up and fly if, you know, for say two people and you don't need the payload or or whatever but yeah it's definitely has the advantage of burning less have gas mm -hmm. for sure. 
Well, and you know, the driver's license medical, you know, your, your certified ASTM standards versus, you know, the FAA CFR mm -hmm. part 23, you know, they're cheaper to own and operate and maintain. And, you know, yeah. I did ASTM testing for years before getting, you know, fully going into aviation. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's not, it's not slack and all that, you know, you're, it, they're definitely covering their bases and, you know, mm -hmm. anything built to that is going to hold up you know, no problems there. So, you know, for your viewers, if they want to really get an idea of all the models that are out there that are considered light sport is to go on uh, by Dan Johnson.com. Dan Johnson's website, he's done a phenomenal job of tracking all the light sports in the industry. You know, what's out there, what's still being supported, what isn't be, being supported. Uh, he'll, he'll do reviews. He does videos. So lists for all special light sport aircraft. Core training is for airplane, but then there's also add-ons for different types. We can sort by manufacturer. We can sort by, you know, the importer. You know, that's a thing when you have uh, conflicts going on in certain parts of the world and, you know, the manufacturing for that light sport is in that part of the world. You might not want to get that one right now. But here we are, you know, Vans Aircraft, RV-12, the Vashon Ranger. I remember the AOPA did a nice spread on them. Uh, Texas manufacturing, you know, there's all kinds, you know, Aero Adventure, the Aventura, you know, you know, there's all kinds of options, American Legend, you know, get the Legend Cub, all kinds of Aerion aircraft. That's the one I was trying to remember earlier. Carbon Cub, Sport Cub. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, if, if you're wondering, you know, what options are out there, I, I highly recommend by Dan Johnson's website. And okay. there's just so much information that you can go off of there right up here we'll see what happens with mosaic oh we're, yeah. we're a year off on that one yeah that's going to be interesting coming up we'll definitely like to follow that um all right I'm so my this. last big question um i i guess want to bring to the table for the viewers is it just makes me step back and think you know you can go to this two-week course and it's called if the repairman certificate is that correct a light sport repairman yes okay. so, light sport repairman certificate light so repairman yeah. certificate and yep. you get an actual you know faa certificate in the mail yeah it has light sport so, repairman right on it so for a guy that doesn't want to go to school and have mm -hmm. time to go to school or want to put the tuition into school but they want to get into the industry as an AMP and they want to look at other avenues as far as the apprentice, but say there's not an availability for a apprentice position where they live, but there is a light sport aircraft. They could actually go get the light sport repairman certificate and work as a mechanic on those local aircraft for say, you know, 30 months or whatever it is for the experience as an AMP, can you do that and then actually go and test as it gets your AMP certificate working independently under this light sport repair certificate? That's my big question. I guess. Absolutely, you can. And then there's the okay. whole, you're basically, you're describing that situation and that's me. <laughs> yep. You know, yep. a mortgage and a family, I can't go back to school for two years. Now, I mean, there are some schools that are 18 months. Uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks is 12 months, but it's extremely mm -hmm. accelerated. And I know some guys that yeah. come through that program. But yeah, mm -hmm. no, if you're like me, there's no way you can go back to school. You're trying to go the apprenticeship route and you're not getting anywhere. Definitely take a good hard look at this um, because, you know, that is the key. You know, you get your repairman certificate. You're limited to what you can work on, but everything you work on, you can log. And mm -hmm. it starts that clock running for that 30 months. Now, yeah. I spoke with uh, our, my local FISDO recently. Um, it's not like, okay, you work on something once a week and then 30 months, now you can get an AMP. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> they have a task list that they want you to complete at least 50% of. And that 30 month figure is based on 160 hours of work completed each month. So, you know, okay. do the math. So, you know, eight hour a day, five days a week, four weeks a month. That's what yeah. they're basing it on. So yeah. you can't you can't just get it not doing anything and still get an AMP. You ha you do have to get it, but there are guys that and if you're in the right market, uh, where I am in Eastern PA, it's not a very huge light sport market. But if you're in you know the land Florida, man, <laughs> I know yeah. the guy in Chicago, Illinois, absolutely killing it. You know it, it really yeah. depends on your market. The you yeah. know the other side of that is you know maybe you couldn't like like me. You couldn't get an apprenticeship before 
But now having this gives you an extra little thing on your resume that does give you a foot in the door. I finished my LSRM class and a week later started at a local repair station. You know, it gave me that leg up on other people. So now I'm mostly doing certified stuff, working as an apprentice under an IA, but I still have the, the, the light sport that I can use and work on the side. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. if you get a light sport, now they have that capability. Somebody who's trained in light sports that can go off and do the sign off and, and do that. So you have two advantages, you know, it sounds like, yeah, I can give you kind of a leg up opportunity maybe over somebody else or if mm -hmm. there's an opening at a repair station or a local FBO repair facility. Um, or if you live in an area that there's a high population of these type of aircraft, mm -hmm. then that in and itself can get you what you need. Like I said, it, it was put in place with the light sport rule back in 2004 but you know, it just wasn't, there's even still, there's FISDOs today that don't believe that it's a thing, but it, it really is. And it, it kind of, it's up to a lot of us to just kind of get the word out there. And you know, if that's what, if that's what you're wanting to do with your life, you know, that's, that's another way of doing it. You know, I, I started really started my aviation journey in 2009. Here I am 2022, finally doing the maintenance side. I already got my pilot license, mm -hmm. but you know, tried to go back to school so many different ways, different states, different areas, couldn't get it done. And then I, you know, a buddy of mine in our EAA chapter sent me an AOPA magazine article about the light sport course and it was on. <laughs> it's oh, like, wow. now I can finally do this. So what options for somebody right now, they're still watching this video. They're very interested and I appreciate your time. You're still watching. And uh, what are some options they can go look up right now? So as I mentioned before, you know, a buddy in the EAA chapter handed me an AOPA magazine or actually sent me an article. Um, they featured, I think it was a, it was a Blue Ridge Community College in Virginia uh, that they do the 120 hour course. And, you know, it was a really nice write up. Uh, but when you actually look into it um, and you, you start studying it, there's really two main options. There, there's that one. Uh, maybe there's some other community colleges that do it. And then there's Rainbow Aviation. That's who I would recommend. Um, you know, it's a 120 hour accelerated course. You know, you're go, there's so much you're trying to cover. It's like drinking through a fire hose. But, you know, the carpenters, you know, the, you know, they're, they've been in aviation their whole lives. Wealth of experience. You know, you think, oh, it's light sport. They only know about like row taxes, whatever. Not true. They, they've been around, they've run an FBO. Uh, you know, Brian was director of maintenance. Brian used to write for the EAA magazine. Uh, he's been a flight or a aviation mechanic of the year. Uh, they just a wealth of information between the two of them. And like I, I said earlier, they were on the rulemaking committee for the light sport rule. You know, okay. there is an LSRM program because of them. So, okay. I mean, I feel like when you're looking at your options, if you know, you go home you, after watching this video, you're Googling, all right, how do I get an LSRM? Just, just go to rainbow aviation <laughs> you know okay. and you know and it's like i said it's it's almost like drinking through a fire drinking out of a fire hose with your class but you know the classroom is set up well the, the it's structured well and then after the class is done you know brian and carol are there to help you you know they are willing to spend you know one-on-one -on -one time with you to share that information and, and class size is limited too there's only about 15 16 people so you, it's not you know so you get a lot more, uh, I'd say, direct attention and direct learning. And if, you know, class is done, there's something more you want to learn. There's something you want more hands-on experience. You can get it. Um, you know, it's not cheap. It's not free. Uh, my, my, I don't know if it's gone up like everything else has. Uh, it's $4,500 for the two-week class. But I mean, with what the, the information you have access to, and like we mentioned, community, the community that we have after you've gone through that, you know, it's always investing in yourself is always a good investment. And I just, you know, it would have been nice to be able to go to school for it. But I think I'm really happy that I went this route. And I, like I said, I'd recommend anybody check out Rainbow Aviation, stack them up against anybody else. And I, I say that that's the way to go. So, mm -hmm. you know, quality of training mm -hmm. um, is a big thing. <laughs> and Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, you know, investing in yourself, you want the best you can get. I mean, obviously within means, I mean, you can't, you know, go to Harvard versus another college that might be 25%, but to some degree, you know, if it's just a little difference between another option, it sounds like, you know, 
this is a place to go, even if they are a little more, I haven't looked into anything, but um, you're going to, it sounds like you're going to get the best, the people that were at the very beginning, the ground zero of this program and have experience. They're pretty well versed. It sounds like um, that definitely needs to be considered for somebody that is looking at different options. Um, you know, and, and for somebody like me that spent so long trying to break into the aviation field and, you know, now I'm finally doing it, you know, 4,500, that's nothing. You know, the opportunity that comes from it is, uh, it's, it's amazing. And I, I do it again for sure. Yeah. So. If anyone has any questions, definitely take a minute, uh, give us some thought and drop those below in the comments. Um, I probably won't be much of a help, but I would definitely look further into your question and get back to you. And we will put some information in the description as far as the, the schooling, and um, the aircraft that are under this category that we mentioned before, and definitely check that out. Uh, you have anything else, Matt, as we close up? Well, I mean, you know, if you kind of want to see a little bit more what I'm into, uh, I do have my own little channel on the side. Uh, I rebuilt a Sonex that was sitting around for a while. But, you know, now that I'm going down this maintenance journey, that's kind of what I'm going to do is focus the channel more on, you know, that side of it, you know, the LSRM and being an AMP apprentice, you know. Uh, if any of you guys out there are, are going down that road and want to see what it looks like, you know, taking 30 months to do this. Well, that's what I'm going to be doing, too, and putting it out there for everybody. So uh, it's it's been quite a learning experience so far, and we'll see what we uh, come through together. Who knows what you'll come across. I'm yeah. sure <laughs> but it's always it's always interesting. You never know in aviation. So absolutely. That's All right. Fair. Well, until next time, be safe and be blessed. And I will see you in the next video. See you. Yeah.